Mom deserves the best, and there's no better place to shop for Mother's Day than Whole Foods Market. They're your destination for unbeatable savings, from premium gifts to show-stopping flowers and irresistible desserts. Start by saving 33% with Prime on all body care and candles. Then get a 15-stem bunch of tulips for just $9.99 each with Prime. Round out Mom's menu with festive rosé, irresistible berry chantilly cake, and more special treats. Come celebrate Mother's Day at Whole Foods Market. You are listening to Women's Running Stories, the podcast where exceptional women runners share inspirational stories about their running experiences. When I think back at when I made the decision to do this run to celebrate my mom, there really wasn't a lot of thought that went into it. It really just felt like this obvious thing that I should do. And when I look back at it, I appreciate that it is one of the, it is how I have felt closest to my mom. When I, and not just through the run, but when I live and and do things in this like bold, brave, wholehearted way that she did, that is how I feel closest to my mom. That is where I like feel the richest, version of my love for her and so I I don't think it was and maybe that's what surprised me but that's what I appreciate most after making the decision is that wasn't necessarily I didn't know that that was why I was doing it but that has become very obvious to me and especially in the now it's been um about four years and a little bit since I lost my mom that 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 is how I stay closest to her and that it that that is absolutely the best thing that I could have done in the months after losing her was have that outlet, that way to stay connected and to feel like I had a place to be putting my love for her. And the run gave me that. I'm Emily Hellman and I live in Eugene, Oregon, and I'm a writer and a runner. Yes, this episode features Emily Hellman, a writer and an ultra-distance trail runner who did, in fact, go on a run. It was a very big run that took many days. Emily decided to go after the record of running across Oregon, south to north, on the Pacific Coast Trail in honor of her mother, Andrea Halnan, who had been her inspiration and her biggest supporter. But before we hear more from Emily, I want to welcome you to Women's Running Stories, I am Cherie Louise Turner. I am the host and producer of this podcast, and thank you so much for being here. This is the story of an enormous challenge that Emily Halnon set for herself back in 2020. Emily's mother, Andrea, died of a rare, aggressive form of uterine cancer in late January 2020. This was after a traumatically short but very fierce fight against the disease. Emily set out on her record attempt roughly seven months later on August 1st of the same year. And this episode is being released on the occasion of Emily publishing her first book. It is a memoir called To the Gorge, Running, Grief, and Resilience on 460 Miles of the Pacific Coast Trail. And it covers this story, but of course, in much more detail. And the book launch is today, May 7th. Congratulations to Emily. I cannot imagine how difficult this book must have been to write, but also in so many ways, really triumphant. It is about processing grief and figuring out how to live a big, beautiful life after a devastating loss. And for the telling of the story on the podcast, the focus really is on the role running plays in this whole process, and that role is very significant. The record Emily was going after was, as it's known in the ultra-distance world, an FKT. And to fill you in on what exactly that is and the specifics about her run, I'm going to let Emily tell you. So the an FKT is... A fastest known time, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's the fastest known time on a certain trail, a speed record on a certain trail. And um, there are FKTs all over the world on different sections of trail. I chose to go after the one on the Oregon stretch of the Pacific Crest Trail or PCT. It's about 460 miles. 
And it goes from the Oregon, California border to the Bridge of the Gods in Cascade Locks, which is on the northern side of the state on the Washington border. And it travels. Um, it's kind of a, I called it like a slow cook tour of some of Oregon's most beautiful landmarks. It goes along the Cascades in Oregon and you see, you travel through some of just some of the most stunning terrain in Oregon from um, the Siskiyou Mountains in the southern part of the state to Crater Lake to all of the major volcanoes in Oregon, Mount Thielsen, Diamond Peak, the Three Sisters, Mount Washington, Mount Jefferson, Mount Hood. Um, and then it travels into the Columbia River Gorge uh, where you reach the Bridge of the Gods. Yeah, this was a huge undertaking. And something else to know about FKTs is that there are different records for different variables like gender. Another big variable is the type of support a runner gets out on the trail. An FKT can be unsupported, meaning the runner carries everything they need with them. They get no help on the trail. Or an FKT can be self-supported. This means that a runner can get some support, but it must be support that's available to all people. Say, like if there's a convenience store near a trail the runner could purchase something there because that convenience store is available to anybody who comes by. Lastly, an FKT could be supported, and this is the type of FKT Emily went after. This means that a runner can get help all along the way from outside sources. So, for instance, other people can bring the runner food and supplies. And this includes having pacers. These are people who join the runner for sections on the trail and run with them. A few final details to know before we get started. Emily mentions I Run Far. This is a popular online magazine covering trail running and ultra-distance running. And she mentions the Brave Like Gabe Foundation, and this is a nonprofit founded by professional runner and rare cancer advocate Gabe Grunwald, who herself died of a rare cancer after a decade-long fight against the disease. Yeah, cancer? sucks. All right. We are ready. This story is told completely in Emily's own voice. I will be back with you after the story is done. So let's get to it. Now to tell her story is Emily Halnon. I got into marathon running because my mom started running marathons when she turned 50 and I was wildly inspired to do one myself because when you watch your 50 year old mother run a marathon, it's hard not to feel inspired to run a marathon. And she really introduced me to the beauty of pushing myself through sport and exploring my limits and, you know, redefining what I could do through marathon running. And for a while, I, I found that through marathons and running faster marathons. I think there are many times I realized my mom is a badass. So she she had a big health scare when I was a teenager. I don't remember what exact age I was, but a formative age. She had her gallbladder removed and it motivated her to change some things about how she lived. And one of those things was to be more physically active. And the way she started engaging in physical activity was through walking. And at first it was really pretty short walks around the neighborhood. And then I think because the Howland women are deeply competitive beings. <laughs> she started race walking and then she started pushing that distance a little and then she started running 5Ks, then 10Ks, half marathons. And then when she turned 50, she did that first marathon. And I think all through that, I appreciated what my mom was doing and watching her go on this journey where she kept pushing herself to do bolder, bigger things with walking and then running. But I think especially that marathon, it, I would think I was 19 when she did the marathon and I just was blown away. I chased her all over Burlington, Vermont, where she ran this marathon and watching her run and she ran, she ran with so much joy that day and watching her at like mile 20, just bouncing through her neighborhood, smiling was so inspiring. And then my mom kept doing this. She kept running. Uh, when I ran my first marathon, she was on her fourth marathon and um, she, she beat me to the finish by 20 minutes. And I went out like you do in your first marathon often, like a total 
jerk and ran way too fast. And I got to watch my very smart mother run by me around the halfway point. And it was the Marine Corps Marathon. So there were tons and tons of people running this. And when she ran by, I like turned into this little girl and was just like, mom, mommy. Like I was having so much trouble running and um, she couldn't hear me. And she just, you know, kept going by in her steady, strong way. And I think I was also in awe watching that contrast to my own experience of running a marathon. And, and then when she turned 60, she decided to learn to swim so she could do her first triathlon. And I think that is so remarkable as a 60 year old woman to decide you want to learn to swim so that you can do a triathlon. And she was so scared of open water, like really, really terrified of swimming in lakes and, and big open bodies of water. And, and to watch her just like forge forward with such courage because she wanted to do triathlons and she loved doing triathlons. That was also another moment where I was just like, my mom is such a badass. She also, that same year, the year she turned 60, she went skydiving to celebrate her birthday. And it's just like, she just was, was endlessly inspiring. And I think gave me many, many moments where I was just in awe of what, what a badass she was. Yeah, we shared running in so many ways. I lived in Vermont until I was about 25. And then I lived in DC for four years. And especially through that time that I was on the East Coast, my mom and I would do so many things together. She always set these very fun and silly and very Andrea Helen goals at the beginning of every year where she would want to like, she was an elementary school teacher for 42 years. And these always felt very elementary school teacher to me. She would be like, I want to run in every county in Vermont. I want to run in like X number of new states. I want to run every calendar month. And that would move her to go to these absolutely ridiculous races around the East Coast, like we road trip to New Hampshire in January to run a 5k. And, we, you know, we drove like eight hours round trip to go run up for, you know, 20 something minutes. Um, and so we did things like that all the time together. And really, she knew that I was an eager participant in those kinds of antics. And so it, I was always an easy yes for her. Um, and then once I moved to DC, and then when I moved to Oregon, she loved coming out to visit me. And that was always such a huge part of our time together was um, she loved to like really know and feel the texture of my life in these places. And, and obviously because running is such a big part of my life, she would want to like see and, you know, go on runs where I were on my favorite trails and paths and neighborhoods. And um, she often would come and do races in places that I lived. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was a huge part of how we spent time together. The thing that first got me into ultra running was just that I ran a faster marathon than I ever expected to run and felt a little lost as to where to go next. And I had a friend who was into ultras and long distance trail running and he suggested I jump into a 50K and I did that. I experienced a lot of culture shock between road running and trail running, um, but also found it very fun and discovered that it was an exciting new way to push myself in running and then kind of kept going. And at the time I lived in Washington, DC and did a few ultras around that area. And then I moved to Oregon now about 10 and a half years ago. And I think especially after I moved to Oregon, trail running and ultra running became a way for me to be exploring these wild, beautiful places that I've grown to love and appreciate so much. And I think that's what's really kept me in ultra running over the last 10 and a half years. Running is such a beautiful way to think about sharing love because it is such a special part of our life. Like you, like runners care a lot about running. And so I think to share running with someone else, you're already like accessing this like deeper, more meaningful thing. Um, and I think like you think about how you connect with different people that you meet in life. And like, if I meet someone at a party, maybe I like them and we have a nice exchange, but I feel like if I meet someone for a trail run, it's like five miles later, I'm like, you are my best friend in the world. And like, each, there's just this, I feel like running is, is such a, there's something about like, we shed so much of the external stuff when we go on runs. And so when we 
go on a run, we're at this like raw or truer part of ourselves. And so our connections are like instantaneously deeper and more meaningful. And it becomes this more enriching way to connect with someone. And so I think there are just these components of running that make it a really powerful way to, to connect with other people. And I think like, like my mom, I think saw running as a love language because it, again, it's like this, such a special, it was such a special thing to her, such a special way to connect with people. And so whether that was going on a run with people or people showing up for her on the sideline or people asking her about a run, it just felt like a more meaningful or it just felt like a very meaningful way to, to show you care about someone. Yeah. I think that, and I, again, it's like one of these, there are so many beautiful ways that we support each other through running too. And we don't, we don't run alone, right? There's so many ways that we are supported and cared for other people through our running. And so I think it's, yeah, it's running is a love love language for how we connect with each other, for how we support each other, for how we, how we share this really special space and time. Um, I think there are, there are just like a lot of beautiful ways that running feels like that to me. I remember my first 50 mile run was in Can Lake, New York. My mom lived in Vermont and um, it was actually a road 50 or like, I think mostly road. I don't remember if there was a little bit of trail mixed in, but so it was very accessible for spectators to get to. And my mom came to watch it and she was probably in like, I don't know, 37 different places along the course cheering me on through this first 50 miler. And she did the same thing. I, before I got into trail running, I, I did some triathlon myself and I did one Ironman in Lake Placid and my mom came out to spectate it. And again, was like everywhere and like wearing a, and Team Howlman t-shirt and making signs. Like she was, she was such a, a very excited cheerleader. And I think because she did it herself, like she really got it and got me. And so even when I started doing runs that were further away that she couldn't necessarily go to as frequently as if I was running something across the state line from her, she, the way she communicated with me about them was very, she knew she knew what was what I was doing and it was always very it meant more than a lot of messages my and my mom was like a prolific Facebook poster during my runs um she I think like during a 100 miler she might post like 17 different times about how I was doing and what she was the cheer she was sending me across the country. Um, I think one of my, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but one of my favorite posts that she put up was before uh, this run called Cascade Crest, which is a 100 miler in Washington through the Cascades. And she said something along the lines of, if someone thinking about you translates to forward movement, then Emily will be flying because I will be obsessed with her progress or something like that. And it was this just like very adorable mom um, thing to post. And so she was, yeah, she was my greatest, absolute greatest cheerleader through everything. I remember my first big adventure run was doing rim to rim to rim, which is running across the Grand Canyon and back. And then I found other adventure runs like running the 93 mile trail around Mount Rainier um, and then got into 100 mile runs and 100 mile mountain runs and, you know, kind of tougher terrain. And it, I felt like I kept finding ways to push myself. And then it wasn't so much a conscious thing, but at some point I recognized that I was no longer doing that. I was doing, I think it was my fifth 100 mile run and I'd grown pretty comfortable in the kinds of goals that I was chasing and the kinds of runs that I was doing and that I wasn't pursuing goals that were asking me to push myself. I was doing runs that I knew I could do and that I was confident in my ability to do. And not that there's anything wrong with running in that way, but for me, I had lost that outlet that I had really loved and appreciated about the sport. And when I saw myself doing that, it was also while my mom was sick with cancer and my mom had always lived in this way that was really bold and brave. And um, she was constantly doing things to push herself. And I think 
Coming to this recognition while my mom was sick was this real like wake up call for me that I had stopped doing that and that I really missed doing that through running. I remember hearing about the idea of doing the Oregon PCT almost immediately after I moved to Oregon, like within a few months of moving to Oregon. And I was just getting to know the Pacific Northwest and falling absolutely in love with the landscape here. And I heard that this runner, Brian Donnelly, who is a great runner from Portland, had set an FKT on this stretch of trail. And he wrote this incredible run report that was published by Iron Far in 2013 and I just like devoured it and I loved the idea and I remember doing the math on it of how many miles he ran a day and it was I don't remember exactly but like 57 or something and I was just like wow that is <laughs> that is too many miles a day for me and even thought like could I do it in twice the amount of time that he took to do it? And he did it in like seven days and 22 or three hours, something like that. And I was like, what if I took two weeks? And it still was like, you know, almost a 50K a day. Um, and so it still seemed just so big, but, but it was in my head. as just this like really cool thing that someone had done. And so when I started thinking about doing a run to celebrate my mom and feeling moved to do something with running that reconnected me to that, you know, bold, brave way of running, like doing something that felt uncertain, doing something that felt like it push would push me and and ask me to to access a deeper strength than I ever had before. Um, the Oregon PCT just really immediately popped into my head. Um, and at this time, this was like seven years after reading Brian's report and I had done a lot more with running at that point and it started to feel it felt like it was for sure more uh, accessible to me than it had seven years prior to that but it still was huge and so I think that I like what was most overwhelming about it the sheer immensity of it was so overwhelming and it, it felt like when I was planning the run it felt like I was playing with monopoly money when I was planning out my days. Cause I was just like, I don't know what, <laughs> like I can say, sure. I'm going to run 60 miles this day, 70 miles the next day, 60 miles again, the day after. And that all sounds good. But like, I don't have any idea how my body is actually going to fare through that kind of, that kind of mileage. Um, and so I think that was the, probably the most overwhelming thing going into it was just the, the, the immensity and the unknown of how that would feel. And then I had so much respect for the people who had set records on the trail and I really considered them to be incredible athletes. And so there was also this like, I'm going after a record that that feels really impressive and that I have a lot of respect and appreciation for the runners who have already set these records. And, and that felt like I was a big challenge as well. When I originally thought about it, I think I was planning on going after the women's supported record. And then as I started planning, I started mapping out a plan to go after the overall FKT on the trail. And that is what I ended up going after. So I had, a, I did it supported. And when you're doing it supported, you kind of plan around where there are access points for your crew to get to you and so that was a lot of how I broke up the mileage and so it varied a little bit like the first day was about 60 miles and then the second day because of access points had to be bigger it was like 70 I think it was 72 miles 70 72 miles and then most days after that we're back in the like 60 or like 58 57 I think the average mileage was about 58 per day so I think my expectations for it were that it was going to be the, by far the hardest run of my life. Um, I didn't know if I could do it. Um, obviously, I believed I had a chance because I decided to start it. But there was a lot of uncertainty going in the run. And there was a lot of certainty that it was going to push me and feel extraordinarily hard. And I would say that it delivered on those expectations and if anything really surpassed them. And I think it's hard to anticipate just how hard something like that is going to be because it's so wildly different than anything I had done before. I had done, like I said, I think about five 100 milers before starting this 460 mile FKT. So it was just a another level of running to do this big multi-day effort. I think at the beginning, it's a thing I, th I think about the run is that it was so many things at once. Like it could be both 
going well and also overwhelming. And I think when I started the run, it was that, that like they're starting from the California border. It was really hard not to think like, holy shit, I've got 460 miles to go. Like I've driven across Oregon a lot and it's a pretty big state and I'm not taking the most direct route and I'm going over all these mountains and I'm doing it with just these two legs beneath me and a bunch of little steps. And so there was a lot of overwhelm at the beginning, um, but there was also a lot of freedom and simplicity in starting. Like there had been all this buildup to the trail, all these logistics, all this training, all this like, you know, all these emotions about starting. And then once I started, it was just kind of like, all right, I live here now. I live on this trail and I'm just putting one foot in front of the other and I'll figure stuff out as it happens. And it felt like there was some, some freedom in that and just being able to, to run. And, and there was a lot of gratitude too, that like I was on one of the most beautiful trails in the world and one of the most beautiful places in the world running for my mom. And that, that was the only thing that I had to think about doing for the next eight days. Yeah. So it was, it was a lot of things at first and it did, it went quite well to start I mean, the first day I did exactly what I was supposed to do and got to where I was supposed to go. And then I would say the second day got a little bit harder because it was that 70 mile day and, and it was a 70 mile day after running 60 miles. So it was not a, you're not starting on fresh legs and you're, I was very aware of how far I had to go after those 70 miles. And so the second day I got a little bogged down by the, um, by the numbers in my head and the numbers on my watch. And then I think once I got through that day, I was able to, to run, I was able to, I think, settle back into having some belief that I could do it, having some confidence in what I was doing. I think the second day got in my head a little bit. And then the fourth day of the run also was, was a really, really joyful day for me. It was the closest day, the closest stretch of the trail to Eugene where I live and run. And a lot of my closest running friends came out that day and, um, and really spoiled me with support. And it was also my shortest day. So I like finished before sunset and got to hang out on a lake with all my friends. And it was a very, very mood boost of a day. Um, that was kind of the first, first half of the run. I think for me, I found it was really helpful to have a reason to move through grief. And I had watched, my mom was sick for about 13 months with cancer. And during the time that she was sick, she continued to live in her very Andrea Hellman way. And, you know, she was, from the beginning, it was a very grim diagnosis that she was facing. and while she certainly felt how hard it was and how depressing it was to be facing the end of her life, she also refused to let that be her only existence. And she really insisted that Joy still have a place in her life, that she would continue to live in this wholehearted way that she had really decided to always make part of her life. And so I think watching her do that and watching that be a really beautiful way for her to live through her hardest experience um, and through the end of her life gave me kind of a, a map of how to make my way through my own grief. And I think that I found having this run was a way for me to to do that through my own hardest thing. And I think it, you know, there were certainly days when I was curled up on the bedroom floor and and just really feeling the weight of my mother's death. Um, and I also think that this run gave me a way to, to move through those feelings, to, to really feel that, I mean, again, going back to running is this place where we just shed all this external stuff and we're kind of left with ourselves and our truest, rawest emotions. And I think running was one of the most helpful places for me to be feeling and processing grief. There are a lot of places where we are not encouraged to fully 
feel our, our grief are our hardest emotions. You know, at the time I was working in a very traditional office job and there were a lot of days when I like ran into the bathroom to cry in a stall because you don't cry in front of people at work. Or um, there were a lot of times when I didn't give a true answer to how are you doing? Or I like, you know, on planes would stuff my face in my sleeve. Like there just are a lot of ways that we're, we're not really encouraged to, to, to feel what we're truly feeling. And I think running is a place where we can just let ourselves be what, what we are, what we're feeling. I mean, you think if you go to like a marathon or a trail race, no one's hiding how they're feeling. <laughs> like it's, it's all out there. And so I think I felt that through all of my training and then the actual run itself was that it was the safe space and this, this outlet to really access and process my hard emotions. And then I think it also, you know, I was so, my mom was so healthy and so full of life when she got sick. She was diagnosed when she was, um, I'm so bad at numbers, but like 65 or 66. And, and she, she was still, you know, biking 70 miles in the morning before going to a coffee shop and reading a book and then doing it again the next day and traveling. She traveled to Glacier National Park to go whitewater rafting and run a half marathon a few months before she was diagnosed. And she was just so full of life. And it really blindsided me that she died when she did. Um, And so I think this run gave me a way to hold her close. um, And it gave me a home for my love for her. I think like when we lose people that we're so close to, we look for ways to stay connected to them and to continue to, to share our love for them. And this run gave me a way to do both of those things with my mom. By far the hardest day on the trail was my sixth day. And on my sixth day, I was set to run one of the probably hardest stretches of the Oregon PCT. It was about 60 miles and it was going to travel past three of the biggest volcanoes, Mount Washington, Three Finger Jack and Mount Jefferson. And so a lot of it was really just kind of on these high alpine open ridge lines with a lot of elevation throughout the day. And on the sixth day, I woke up to, I guess I didn't wake up to it, but it quickly (laughs) deteriorated into a very harsh alpine storm. It felt like a winter storm in August and a friend had warned me that the weather had shifted. When I packed for the run, it was nothing but blue skies and sun and summer temperatures. And I of course came prepared for things to be different than that, but nothing could have emotionally or physically prepared me for how uh, horrific of a turn the weather took that day. Um, It felt like a winter storm. I think the temperature must have been hovering in kind of like the just above freezing range of like 33 and a half degrees where the rain's not quite turning into colder precipitation, but it's on the verge of it. And it was just, it was cold. It was pelting rain. The wind was so harsh that sometimes I would feel like I was about to get blown off a ridgeline. I would have to like steady myself on the ground with my hand. I, I couldn't hear my friends. I quickly, all of the layers of clothing that I was wearing became absolutely penetrated. I felt by rain, I felt like the this like icy rain was drilling into my bones. There was just no relief from the weather. And because of this, how this stretch of trail was situated against access points, I had just huge sections where I wasn't having access to my crew. I think the biggest section was like 30, let's say 34 miles. My friend Eric was with me the entire day and my friend Emily was with me for that 30 something mile stretch. So the three of us were together through that. Um, but those 34 miles were not going by very quickly. It was my sixth day, so I was quite tired and I was dealing with a little bit of lower leg pain and um, I just, it was, it was mountainous terrain. It was, they were very slow miles and, and I had never felt so like irreparably cold and uncomfortable from the weather before. And there just was no escape, you know, no, no, like phone a friend, get dry clothes. It was just like you need to keep putting one foot in front of the other and enduring this absolutely wretched weather. 
And and that day continued. I felt like it was just the day of endless (laughs) challenges. (laughs) Sometimes someone would say something and they would have to shout it again to stand any chance of being heard because the wind was so loud and howling. There was also like some steep snow fields that we crossed and some hard to navigate like boulder fields where we would lose the trail and a bad river crossing. And I remember once seeing like this tiny little speck of blue up overhead and and being like, I think the weather might change. And I remember Emily, who has years and years of experience in in like wilderness education and as a wilderness guide being like, that's what we call a sucker hole. And like, there's no chance the weather is changing. Emily also wrote me haikus that day. So she kept like pulling these like wet pieces of paper out of her hat and reading me haikus. It was the sweetest thing that she could have done. And then, and then we got to a a ridge after this 30 something mile stretch of trail where my partner Ian and my dog Dilly and Eric's wife Gretchen crewed us with, I think they brought like a sleeping bag and it was about a mile and a half from the trailhead. So they had to hike stuff in, but they brought all kinds of warm clothes and a stove to make me hot cocoa and ramen and like anything warm that could help me like get my core temperature back up. And the rain had stopped at this point. So I could like lie in the sleeping bag and get warm again. And I actually like fell asleep a little bit on this ridge because it was like, I don't know, midnight or something when we got to this ridge. And I still had about 10 miles to get to my stopping point for the night. And I was in this sleeping bag and kind of like drifting in and out of sleep. And like, I had been so cold all day and I finally like was a little bit comfortable in body temperature. Um, and I didn't want to do anything but stay in this sleeping bag. And my friend Eric was kind of like, because he was going to be pacing me for the next 10 miles, was like, what do you think, Emily? Like, should we get back on the trail? And there was I like negative ounces in my body that wanted to get back on the trail at some at that point. And I finally pushed myself out of my sleeping bag and stood up and got ready to go and was like, okay, let's do this. And Eric in that moment said, this is how records are won. In the moment, I think, I, I knew, I knew that, so we were, I had about 10 miles left to go that day. And I knew if I didn't go, that it was probably saying goodbye, at least to the overall record. And yeah. and I didn't want to do that. As much as I didn't want to keep going, I didn't want to say goodbye to the overall record at that moment in time. And so when Eric said that, it felt very true to me. I. I didn't want it to be true because legitimately no part of me wanted to keep going into that night. I was, I had been so tired and uncomfortable and miserable all like for hours and hours and hours. And I knew that at the rate we were moving, it was going to take us another three or four hours to get to the stopping point for the night. And that meant finishing at like 4 a.m. And it it was the last thing in the world that I wanted to do. But I do think that it's those moments that are the difference makers of like what, you know, what's what would have still been a very good effort, but what differentiates it between being that good effort and that like outstanding effort. And I think like, I think about this on just like training runs that I go on that like, I live in Oregon and it's currently the beginning of April. So we're just emerging from the time of year when it's, you know, miserable, gross, rainy, cold conditions. And you're mostly just running your like small loops around your backyard trails, nothing super exciting. And how like I can go on a long run and maybe I get to a point where it's like, this is a totally like fine long run, but am I going to make the decision to like do one more lap up this hill and make it like the kind of long run that I came to do today? And that's not to say that more is always more because it's not, but that there's like these moments where it's like what you've done is fine, but what like, what de- what little decision are you making to push through something that seems kind of undesirable or really, really undesirable that sets it apart? And I think like that moment with Eric was that decision that, yeah. that set it apart. The day ended up taking me, I think over 20 hours. I think I finished around four in the morning. And so it just also was like a very long, tiring day. I finished my 
seventh day on the trail and knew that I had, I don't remember the exact mileage, but about 56 miles, let's say, left to go and plenty of time to do it. I felt like, okay, I can do this. And when I woke up the next day, it was like, when I woke up the next day, I think I like laid sleepless in the back of the van for like an hour and a half. That made, I mean, that made it sound like I got this like nice full night of sleep before the last day. That was not what happened. But I think when I was in the face of the last day, I knew that barring some like ankle twisting, something horrible kind of accident that I could do it. But really, because so much can happen, it wasn't until that last day that I really felt like I can do this, I'm going to do this. And then on the last morning, it was a like, I'm going to do this. And that day felt, it was hard still, and there was a lot going on. But all throughout the day, I felt very like, heck yeah, like we are making it to that bridge. The finish was so incredible. I was so beautifully supported throughout this run from start to finish. I had so many friends come out and crew me and pace me and surprise me with trail magic treats along the way. And I was fundraising for Brave Like Gabe and it, I just was showered in donations for um, for Gabe Grunold's Foundation for, for Rare Cancer Research. And on the last day, it was incredible how many people showed up to to be there for this finish and to celebrate this finish. And as I was descending through the Columbia River Gorge and into the final kind of mile or so into the bridge, I kept seeing new clusters of, it was like 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. or something at night. And I kept seeing, so it was dark, I kept seeing new clusters of headlamps and I would know like, oh my gosh, there's another group of my friends who are here to like, support me and cheer me in to the end of this run. And it was so, it like, just moved me so much to see how many people had like waited for the, through the night to be there for this moment. And so I kept seeing these clusters of headlamps. And then as I got closer into the town of Cascade Locks, where the Bridge of the Gods is, I saw more clusters of headlamps and then the actual finish is you run halfway across the bridge, the Bridge of the Gods, which is this huge steel, uh, like graded bridge over the Columbia River, which slices a border between Oregon and Washington. And then there's a sign halfway across the bridge that says like, welcome to Washington or something along those lines. And I, I ran out to that and, and touched the guardrail beneath it, which marked the border. Um, it was, an, as you can imagine, an extraordinarily emotional finish. I was thinking a lot about my mom all that day. My mom had always been my first call and my greatest cheerleader through anything of that kind of magnitude, um, anything big. Um, and so, you know, all I wanted to do that day was call her and talk to her and tell her I was going to do it and tell her I was going to do it for her. And so I was just so overwhelmed with emotions for how much I missed her and love her and um, wanted her to be there. And then there was also, of course, so many emotions of like finishing the run and doing this thing that I wanted to believe I could do, but, but really didn't believe I could do until that last morning. Um, and so feeling myself finish this run and achieve this thing that I cared so much about was incredible doing it surrounded by so much support and by the same, you know, people who had supported me through the last several months of grief. It, it just, it was so emotional in so many ways. I was out there for seven days and 19 hours and 23 minutes or 22 minutes. I always forget which is which one. Um, and I thought about my mom a lot while I was running and um, a, a beautiful and hard thing about uh, living without my mom now is it is very easy to imagine how she would show up in certain things. And it was very easy to imagine how my mom would have been just ferociously cheering me through my PCT run and how incredibly proud she would have been of me. I think for me, I was, I mean, filled with so much gratitude that I got to do it and that I, that I was so supportive and loved through it and that I had this chance to celebrate my mom and, and to raise money for Brave Like Gabe. That felt like a really meaningful thing to be able to do after losing my mom to a rare cancer. 
And I think it also reflecting back on it, it felt so reaffirming to have attempted this run. And I think whether or not I had touched the bridge in under record time, I, I think I felt how reaffirming it was to have decided to try to reconnect with running in the way that I that I had lost over time and to make a decision to run and live like my mom had always done in that really courageous, joyful, bold way. And I think especially going through going through grief you, I, I I think grief is a very individual journey, but when I went through grief, I really felt um, the temptation or I felt the ways that it, it is very tempting to want to shelter yourself, to like turn into a little turtle and hide in your shell so that you never have to experience pain or heartbreak or fear or anxiety again. And I think this run gave me a way to really move away from that temptation and to live in that way that my mom had, that she chose to to live in a vulnerable way, to put herself out there, to do things that she was scared of, to do things she didn't know if she could do, to do things she might fail at. And I think doing this run and getting to the other side of Oregon, touching the bridge, everything just like really reaffirmed for me, like that is how I want to live. I want to live in a way that allows me to access the, these things extraordinarily special moments, miles, experiences that I wouldn't be able to do if I kept myself in that little shell. Um, and I think similarly, if I continue running in this really comfortable way where I'm not pushing myself, I think that's the running version of being inside that shell. And I really, this run really, for me, felt like it hardened the idea that I, I wanted to not be running or living in that shell. That does bring us to the end of Emily Halnon's story on the podcast. Emily continues to live big and bold. The publication of this, her very first book, is certainly a testament to that. I want to thank Emily for coming on the podcast and sharing this story and for bringing it into the world in her new book, To the Gorge. And once again, congratulations, Emily, on becoming a published author. If you, like me, want to keep up with Emily, I, of course, will provide links to how you can do that on social media. I will also link to her website where you can order her book. I also wanted to give a sort of by the numbers about this record and also let you know where this record stands since it was set several years ago. Emily's time was 7 days, 19 hours, and 23 minutes. The two records Emily had her sights on were, first, the women's record, which had been set in August of 2019, a year before Emily set her record, and that was set by Danielle Snyder in a time of 9 days, 15 hours, and 8 minutes. And then there was that record that Brian Donnelly had set in 2013, of seven days, 22 hours, and 37 minutes. That record has since been broken a couple of times last year in 2023, but Emily still holds the record for women supported on the Oregon stretch of the PCT. And that does bring us to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for being here. I always appreciate you listening. And I would love it if you shared this podcast with somebody else who you know would enjoy these stories. That is going to do it for me. I am Cherie Louise Turner, the host and producer of Women's Running Stories. And until next Tuesday, I do wish you strong, healthy, confident strides forward. Women's Running Running. Running Running stories. stories.
There is no hood like parenthood. When you meet a fellow parent, you just kind of get each other on a whole nother level. Hi, I'm Kanika Chanda Gupta. I'm a former CNN journalist, mom of three, including twins, and host of That's Total Mom Sense, the podcast. I interview change makers on their life lessons, legacy, and superpower of intuition, aka their mom sense and dad sense. I've had some pretty amazing parents on my show. Hey, what's up? I'm Kelly Rowland. Hi, this is Chelsea Clinton. It's me, Bobby Brown. Can't wait to share my story. Episodes release every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube. Join my tribe at thatstotalmomsense.com and follow me on Instagram at Kanika Chanda Gupta. I'm thrilled to be on this journey with you.